This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, uh, this is an elderly male patient who has phacolytic glaucoma. Uh, he presented quite late. His symptoms were almost about uh, 20 days of uh, pain and redness and uh, he didn't come to the clinic and now this is the situation. Uh, we have controlled the intraocular pressure and inflammation with medications and he's now doing the surgery. My plan is to do a manual small engine cataract surgery. So I begin my surgery by injecting a very small amount of uh, lignocaine in subconjunctivally with a 26 number needle. Then I am doing a peritomy followed by using blunt cannula to inject about 1.5 ml of lignocaine into the posterior subtenon space. I am expecting the surgery to be slightly long because this case uh, looks to be having a severe zonal adhesions and in the inferior quadrant I can see uh, these fluffy lens matter which appears to be at the level or above the equator of the lens. I am not sure about it. So I begin my tunneling and notice uh, how I stabilize the globe. I make a small groove in the sclera itself, much posterior uh, to the incision which is actually planned. And this is where I hold the, or stabilize the globe using the tooth forceps. I wouldn't want to hold any part of the conjunctiva there. Planning to make a 6 or 6.5 mm sclerocorneal tunnel. Uh, 1.5 mm behind the limbus, it slightly frown. Uh, using a crescent blade, a uh, tunnel is being created. The idea of uh, this tunnel or the shape of the tunnel is such that it is the central part will be 1.5 mm on either side of the limbus and progressively as we go to the periphery, you can see the distance between the scleral incision and the limbus increases as does the internal lip as well. So we have a biconcave looking sclerocorneal tunnel. The side ports are done, the anti-capsule is stained, a viscoelastic is used to deepen the antechamber. When I am entering into the antechamber, the blade is tilted so that the inner lip always uh, runs uh, parallel to the limbus so that the inner edge never touches the limbus. It's always running parallel to the limbus. So this ensures long-term stability of the tunnel incision. And I'm using a bent 26 number needle to puncture the anticapsule. And the moment I puncture the anticapsule, it becomes very evident that the bag is extremely loose. It may not be possible for me to save the bag. My planning is to just get a rexus and try to insert a ring in. Looks to be very unlikely. So I complete the rexis somehow using a forceps. Using two Sinsky hooks, I'm mobilizing the nucleus out of the bag and then the nucleus is delivered out uh, using a phaco sandwich technique. At this moment, I realize that the bag is extremely loose and it is impossible to salvage the capsular bag. So I'm just using the capsular forceps to peel the bag out and convert it into an intercapsule extraction. Now this area with the cortex or some lens matter seems to be mixed with the vitreous itself. So without much hesitation, I go in with my vitrector. So I'm planning to do a bimanual antivitrectomy. Takes care of the suspected prolapsed vitreous as well as the lens matter. And in just a couple of minutes, we can clear both the vitreous and the lens matter very efficiently. So now I'm in a cortex mode. I want to remove all the exudative membrane which is there on the surface of the iris. Then with the same cutter, I change my settings. I minimize the cut rate to the minimum and then use aspiration and cut mode and do a peripheral iridectomy in the under the sclerocorneal tunnel. So once it's done, now is the time to place the lens. So I planned an iris claw lens and we have the correct diopter lens ready. Uh, at this moment, I am also introducing some pilocarpine into the eye to constrict the size of the pupil a little bit. I am not sure whether I will be successful because long-standing inflammation would have damaged the sphincter muscle. Luckily for me, the pupil does come down. I am making another fresh side port here. 
The first side port has quite a long corneal tunnel. So I'm making a, a fresh a limbal paracentesis incision with a very short intracorneal tunnel. So this would help me to get the enclavation much better. That was the idea. On the other hand, the other side put, I was quite happy. So I go in with my iris claw lens. I'm holding this with the iris claw lens forceps. Just want to take a moment here to explain how I'm holding the lens with my forceps. The position of the edge of the forceps directly corresponds to the level of the notch. So that is the idea. By doing this, I get an indirect clue where the claw in the haptic is. The enclavation instrument which I'm going to use is a 26 number hydrodissection cannula. So it goes to the side port and the lens is just lifted up a little bit now. So once it's lifted up, you go in and tap on the iris, it just gets enclaved. In just one attempt itself, I have a good enclavation. I pull the lens away just to check that the iris has got properly enclaved. Now time to repeat it other side. Before that I just come out, inject a little bit of viscoelastic. Again note the position of the edge of my forceps. This is directly in line with the expected claw in the haptic. So it's easier for me to know where the claw is. This is one small trick which I would like to share here. So because I know where exactly to press now. So it goes in here and uh, I know where the claw is going to be. I just want to press it just beside it. And that's it. It just gets engaged. I just confirm by pulling it once. Now I go behind the lens with retractor to remove some of the OVD which has gone in. That's it. Unfortunately, some amount of uh, blood has entered into the antechamber and some would trickle down into the vitreous as well and take some time for it to clear. Uh, this is how the surgery looks at the end and I'm not putting any suture to the scleral tunnel incision. The conjunctiva is closed with the uh, etovicryl suture. This is the first day picture. The cornea is edematous. There is some amount of secondary glaucoma is there and also inflammation. Uh, the pressure was 34. Over a period of time, with steroids and anti-glaucoma medication subsides. And the patient is doing pretty well with good visual recovery. And at the end of six weeks, the pressure is normal without any medications. And we did an OCT of macula as well and uh, there is no cystoid macular edema. Iris claw lenses are a great way to handle these complex situations. So they are a very quick way to manage these complex cases, you know, wherein we don't have adequate capsular support. To conclude, I would like to share three tips while using an iris claw lens. I learned these three tips from Dr. Ravijit Singh from Amritsar. The first would be, you know, when you are making a paracentis sensation, it should be posterior limbal with a very short intracorneal tunnel. It should be more like a stab incision, not with any long intracorneal tunnel. This will help us to manipulate the instrument effectively and also prevent us from engaging the more central iris into the claw. The second tip is to use this special forceps, the iris claw lens forceps. The third tip would be it's probably the most important one for me. I would want to scratch the lens in such a way that the edges of the forceps are exactly corresponding to the, the place where the claw of the haptic keys, that's the gap in the haptic keys. This is the area where we're going to enclave. So if we are positioning the edge of the forceps in such a way that it's in line with the gap in the haptic. So when the haptic goes under the iris, we know exactly where that gap is. It helps us in positioning the enclaving instrument in such a way so that we can get it right in just the first attempt itself. So these are the three tips I would like to share with you all. Thank you so much for watching and hope you found this helpful.